All right, so today we're going to be going over the basic system and layout for the EMS system here at the Fairfield campus for Solano Community College. Uh, we're going to be covering the central plant, which is the room we're in today, that covers the chillers, the cooling towers outside, the condenser water pumps, the chilled water pumps, as well as boilers in the next room over and their associated hot water pumps. Uh, just to give you a basic idea of how the system works out here is each of the buildings has their own air handlers inside of them. Uh, those air handlers have heating, mostly cooling on them. And then down in these zones, you have VAV boxes that can provide reheat so that we can get warmth into the spaces out there. Uh, each building kind of operate on its own and it has their own booster pump locally out there for chilled water and hot water. Um, so the sequence kind of goes, you have occupancy in a building, the buildings drive occupancy for the central plant. So once a building, any one of them goes occupied, uh, it in turn starts to need to use one of the coils, whether it's hot water or chilled water coils. It will signal that call, turn on its local booster pump, and then pass a call over here to the central plant so that these units can respond and provide the appropriate temperature of water that is needed. Um, so now we've got our call here at central plant. The chillers will start up or the boilers, depending on if it's a chilled water or hot water call from any one building out there. And then once those are up and running, we'll get into more detail over here on how the sequencing of those work and how they operate uh, to keep the campus happy and everybody comfortable. All right, so uh, to access anything on the EMS here, there's uh, a variety of options we provided to the campus and maintenance staff here to manipulate, to view their system, to make adjustments to it, um, and even to review history on it and you know any energy savings that may be happening. Uh, the main avenue of access here is via a, a web server we call it, uh, right now it is Delta Web. We'll be moving to IntelliWeb, which is the latest version. Basically, it's a server located in the IT room. Over here, I believe it's Building 100 that houses all the servers in there. And to get to it, you can use any one of the browsers that are out there right now, whether it's Safari, Chrome, Firefox, or uh, good old Internet Explorer. I choose to use Firefox for most of my stuff. Um, so here we're just using my machine because I trust it and it works. So to get to the server, there's an associated outside world IP address. I have it saved as a favorite here. But if you look in on the monitor and you know this address, this IP address is noted, it's sent out in emails, um, we can get it to you anytime you need it. But the, can't be able to see it? That's no problem because you'll have it in an email or written down somewhere for sure. Uh, but it is 204 period 17 period 179 period 84. Uh, so in order to get to the web browser side or the web server, you'll put in that IP address along with forward slash delta web, all one word, forward slash login, L-O-G-I-N dot A-S-P. And once you've entered those in the address bar of whatever browser you choose to use, you can hit go and it will take you to a login page that looks exactly like this one. Uh, mine already has a username and password saved in there. It's the one Trinity uses. Um, but we can create any number of logins, whether it's for the maintenance staff, uh, management. Uh, I've even created some for teachers down in rooms so that they can switch exhaust fans on and off in their labs that are too noisy during class time. So it's very flexible. You'll put in whatever username and password has been assigned to you. Click login. So once we log in, we get to the central 
uh, main graphic because there are several different campuses here for Solana Community College. Uh, currently uh, on to the Delta BACnet system, we run Vacaville Campus and Fairfield right now, which you can see are a couple options there. My screen may look a little different than yours depending on the user level account that's assigned or how you want to view things. Sometimes all you're going to see when you log on is a graphic just like that. Um, mine, you know, this Trinity Tech level one has this extra options over here where we are able to get down into each device uh, that is on the network and make any adjustments directly there and write and change code inside of those controllers without having to go through the graphics to get to those. For most cases, you're just going to have a graphic like this guy here. And today we're doing the Fairfield campus, so we're going to select the Fairfield button. And then we get a, a map taken from, I believe, Solano's website directly. And on it, it lists all the different buildings, outbuildings, uh, parking lots. And as we cut over the systems and each building and take control of things, uh, these buttons then become selectable. So there's several buildings, building 100, 300, all the way around the 500, 600, 7, 8, that as you hover your mouse over, you'll see you'll get the little pointer hand on there, which shows that it's actually a link, and we do have controls in that space. Today we're focusing on 2000, which is the central plant building we're in right now. And we'll start out there. So when you go into a building, you'll reach what is kind of a main menu for each building. Uh, each building can have different things, may have lighting controls, may have outside lighting controls. Um, there may be various set point pages, VAV summaries, uh, actual graphics of air handlers, air handler set point pages. So we created a main menu so that you can choose and kind of navigate into whatever system you need to right away. For starters, we'll go into the chilled water plant. So the first thing we come to in the chilled water plant is our basic graphic layout that shows us, the, that represents the towers that are out back, um, and then as well as the piping for the four condenser water pumps. And that piping heads in to each chiller so that we can bring in the tower condenser water through the chiller and back out to the towers to maintain what we need to do. And then it shows also the isolation valves at each chiller. Um, there are commands in there and statuses pretty uh, basically labeled in there. It's very user friendly to get along with. We have temperature points on the condenser side. That's these little kind of yellow icon looking ones. It, is made to represent like the mercury thermostats that you have sticking in a mechanical pipe. It's probably not going to come up with the writing, I doubt. Um, so those are the temperatures, pumps, isolation valves. Then we pass over to the chillers themselves. Um, they can give an example of if they're running or not with the little blue flowing in there right now. They're set up to show that so you can see what it looks like if a chiller is running. Uh, and then we get to the chilled water side isolation valves on each chiller. And then out to the three chilled water pumps. And then this is where it represents being pushed out to all the buildings around the campus. And then on the return side, you have a supply and a return temperature for that as well that lets us know what kind of differential we're getting as we get chilled water out and back in. Uh, there is also on this loop a chilled water differential pressure transducer. And it's represented in the graphic right there. It is out in the loop. Uh, it's actually just inside the room over here. I can't show you with the cameras right now, but we'll point it out to you. Um, and then the purpose of that is to dictate what speeds our VFDs on our chilled water pumps are going to run. So to get back to the sequence that we were going through, uh, a building goes occupied out there, air handler starts up, VAV zones go occupied, and the air handler needs to put out cold air, colder than what is available from outside air. 
And so it creates a request for chilled water as it opens up its coil valve out there. That in turn passes the flag over here to the central plant where we begin to run our pumps for the chill water system. So the pumps and the chillers all have an order that they run through and that all these settings are located under the settings and set points menu. Uh, you can map to it directly from the top up here in this graphic or you can go previous and map to it directly from the main menus page right there. Uh, I know some of this is small, um, but you know, any questions, once you get a closer look and we'll be able to explain things a little better. But just to run through how our sequence goes, we have our chilled water pumps represented in this block right down there. And inside of there, we have our, via, our chilled water pump one, two, and three and then our differential pressure set point and our actual pressure reading coming back from the loop. So which pumps start to run are dictated by the lead lag order of the chillers themselves. So we have three chillers here, two of a similar size and one smaller one. Um, and what we do is right here in this mode request box in the graphic is a thing called, or an item called chiller selection. So inside of there, it looks like just a number, one, three, two, two, three, one. Uh, but what that is, is actually telling us the order for the lead lag uh, order for our chillers. So currently we're set at one, three, two, which means our lead chiller is chiller number one. And then as demand in the loop increases and more chilled water is needed or more capacity to maintain the chilled water set point, uh, then chiller number three will come on and the very worst case, which I don't believe it's ever happened before, is chiller number two as a last resort where you have all three of them running. Um, on these systems, uh, we always start with the large chiller, so your lead is always going to be one or two. So your number there is always gonna start with a one or two. Um, and then three comes in as your, your lag one and or whichever one is lag one and lag two. So based on those selections, that starts up the chilled water pumps. So the call comes in, the ISO valve will open for the lead chiller, in this case, chiller number one. Then that associated chill water pump with chiller one will start up and attempt to maintain the pressure out in the loop uh, via the transducer that we spoke about. Once that pump is running, we have the ISO valve open, we show status on the system, then we're free to enable our lead chiller. Uh, when that happens, the lead chiller actually gets enabled through BACnet. There is no hardwire um, command to these systems. What we do is we speak through a BACnet interface up here in this panel, this York panel, and we pass the command over to the network to tell whichever chiller we would like to run or begin to run. Once that chiller is up and running, uh, on the flip side of that, in order to get the chiller running, we also have to have the condenser water pumps running. So they start up as well at the same time as the chilled water side so that we can make sure we have flow through both sides of the chiller before we ever try to run that chiller. Uh, when the condenser water pumps run, they also have a lead selection inside of this little box right there, labeled condenser water pumps. Currently they are set for 231, just like the chillers. Uh, that just represents the number of piece of equipment and it's going to be lead, lag one, lag two. Right now, lead is our condenser water pump two, and then uh, lag is lag one is number three, lag two is number one. Uh, it's been proven with this system that we need to have at least two of these condenser water pumps running. There is no v, there are no VFDs on these, so what we have to do is basically we start the lead and whatever lag one pump is, so that it can provide enough flow through these chillers without them shutting down on any safeties. Uh, anything less than two pumps, we have proven on any of the chillers that they will keep shutting themselves down 
due to lack of flow going through them. So now we have chilled water pumps, condenser water pumps running. Next thing that happens is our chiller is enabled. And then we pass that through the network. Down here is where we actually tell the chillers what temperature we would like to achieve out of them. Each chiller has its own onboard controller. It maintains all of its own functions internally. So basically we give it a green light and a set point and it is up to that chiller and its onboard controls to get us the desired temperature coming out of it. So under, over here under the chiller side, you can see a flag for each chiller, chiller one, two, and three, uh, once you can see a little closer. And there is a chill water request flag, which is based off of our chiller selection order, as well as a call for chilled water out in the system. Each chiller also gives us the status of the ISO valves on condenser water and chilled water side. And then we have a differential pressure on that chiller as well, so we can see how it's loading up and what's going on there. And then lastly, at the bottom of each chunk here for each chiller is the actual chilled water supply set point for that chiller. Um, and once again, we just give that set point to each unit and the unit it does whatever it needs to and is capable of to maintain that temperature coming out. Uh, when the lag situation comes in on these guys is we have a 45 degree set point on all of them at the moment. If we are not achieving that set point for a, an allotted amount of time and all of this is adjustable, um, then we do call the lag chiller to come on. So if there's a heavy demand, a very hot day here in Fairfield, a lot of chilled water being used out there, then we need to bring up a second chiller so that we can keep up with that demand and actually supply 45 degree water out to these buildings. So that covers just about everything under there. The other thing of note on this page is the cooling towers um, that run on the condenser side. Those guys, uh, there is no lead lag to them. They both come on in parallel. They each have a VFD on them. And we have a condenser water supply set point for those, which is currently 70 degrees for the condenser water system. So what happens is the EMS system monitors that temperature and we will uh, adjust the signal to the towers in order to maintain that 70 degrees or better. Uh, so control of the towers and their temperature is through the EMS, whereas the chillers, all we can do is give them a set point and it is up to the chiller to ramp up or down, load up or unload in order to maintain or achieve that temperature we're asking out of them. On the flip side, there's also the hot water system here in the plant. And it's uh, very similar to the chilled water system as far as sequence operates. A building goes occupied out on the campus. The zones, the reheat zones down in the building request hot water. That in turn triggers the uh, pump locally at each building. And that will then send the flag over here to the boiler or hot water plant. Once that flag comes over, just like uh, over on the chill water side, our hot water pumps will start. They do run in a lead lag sequence. And in this little box here is where you can adjust. You have your request flag at the top saying, hey, there's zones that are looking for hot water. Then the hot water pump selection, which is currently 312. So hot water pump three is lead. Hot water pump one is lead one, lag one and hot water pump two is lag two. Once those, we get a signal, the lead pump will open up its isolation valve. That pump will start to flow water and run. And it will also maintain, just like on the chill water side, a differential pressure out in the loop. So we have a 10 PSI set point on that right now. The EMS system will monitor that transducer signal and that pressure and ramp the pump up or down as needed to maintain that 10 PSI out in the loop. Once we have those pumps running, we also open up 
our associated boiler. There is no lead lag selection on these. Uh, well, there is, but there's only two of them. So rather than seeing the numbers of uh, three, two, one, where we have multiple, more than two pieces of equipment, what we have here under the boiler side in this mode request panel in the graphic is an enable signal, which is based off a hot water system request. It is also based on a outside air lockout both the chilled water and hot water systems monitor outside air and will lock themselves out accordingly. For the hot water, that outside air lockout set point is right there, currently set to 90 degrees. Then the boiler selection is just the selector box that actually spells out boiler one or boiler two, currently where boiler two is our lead. And then that boiler's ISO valve is opened up that boiler is given a start command and we currently have a set point of 185 degrees on that hot water loop on that boiler right now. That was too far. So that covers how our plants start up, the basic sequence of how we get things running over here and how they operate. Uh, I wanted to show you as well because I missed it. On the chilled water side, that outside air lockout is in the same mode request panel like it was on the hot water system. And uh, currently the outside air lockout for the chilled water system is 66 degrees. All right, so now that we've gotten an overview of how the system all works here, I want to get a little more in depth into how the lead lag system works for the hot water pumps, chill water pumps, chillers, boilers, um, and also how you can manipulate all these points I've kind of been showing you as we go along. We're going to start here on the hot water side. Um, so the graphic here, as we had before, shows our boilers, our three hot water pumps. Um, so up here where we had our selection, the hot water pumps lead lag control panel, uh, for lack of a better term inside of the graphic. Down here, uh, just below our lead lag selection, the hot water pump selection, which chooses what order they run in, is our status flag for our lead and lag hot water pump. Uh, we rarely, uh, I don't think I've ever heard of running more than two hot water pumps at one time. So here we just have a lead hot water pump start stop and a lag hot water pump start stop. So for those objects, uh, the lead of course is triggered by a call out in the campus for hot water, whether it's a zone or what have you. Uh, the lag hot water pump start stop though is triggered by the criteria just below it. So just below it here, we have a hot water pump lag on set point and a lag off set point. So currently the lag on is 98%, the lag off is 70%. So what that means is if our lead pump gets above 98% or above as far as VFD output, then we are assuming that we need more flow out in the system. So what we do is start a timer, which is adjustable for a couple minutes to make sure that we don't cycle the lag pump on and off then we bring on the lag pump, whatever is uh, chosen via the hot water pump selection at the top of the panel right there. So right now, lead pump is number three. It's running along. If it were to get to 98% or above and stay there for a couple minutes, then we would bring on hot water pump number one. And when that happens, its ISO valve opens up, then that pump will start to run and then the two pumps will run in tandem at the same uh, BFD output or speed. So as soon as one comes up, then one and three now speed will match each other and maintain that 10 PSI set point out in the hot water loop. Now, as demand decreases out there, that's where the lag offset point comes in of 70%, and it works just the opposite of the on. So if those two pumps, the lead and lag running, their common speed drops below 70% as it's set right now, then what you have is a, 
enough demand or a, a lack of demand out in the loop that you can go back to running just your lead pump. So once we drop below that 70% for a couple minutes to make sure it's a real case, then the lag pump shuts off, VFD turns off, gives it a few seconds, then the ISO valve closes off and we're back to just a single pump running. Uh, as far as the boilers go, we haven't had to run two boilers. One boiler has always been able to maintain the loop out there. The other side of things is the chilled water plant. So on the chilled water plant, as we mentioned, there's condenser water pumps and there's chilled water pumps and they have lead lag capabilities as well as the chillers themselves. So we'll start off with the chilled water pumps. Taking a second to update in there. And I'm looking for the lag on because it's hard to read. I think I just blew that one. Okay, edit that out. We're gonna look at the chillers. <laughs> and they're what uh, enables the lag chiller to come on when needed. So over here on the far right of the chill water settings and set points graphic is the chiller lead lag information here. Uh, we spell out the chiller order. So over here in the mode request, we simply say one, three, two, or two, three, one. Uh, over here, we actually call out so that you can see chiller one is lead. Chiller two is lag two, and chiller three is lag one, meaning chiller one first, then number three, then number two, worst case scenario. Right underneath it is where we monitor the amps coming back from the unit. Um, this is where we are getting information from these chillers via their BACnet interface. Uh, they give us a percentage of load that they're running. We calculate out that amperage based on uh, the nameplate full load amps for each chiller. And we multiply out that little percentage and we get our amps that the chiller is running at. So we report each one, chiller one, two, and three amps. And then uh, just like on the other systems, you have your lead, lag one, lag two, start, stop flags to tell you what state your system's in if we're trying to run one chiller, two chiller, or three. Uh, just below that, we get into the lead, uh, lag, and lag one and lag two amps. So in order to monitor the system, you know, not the same chiller is always lead and not the same chiller is always lag. So what we do is we take a little combination of whatever chiller is lead and we plug in its amps for the lead amp. So that is the lead chiller. Whichever chiller is running lead, its amps will report right there. For the lag, same thing, report and lag two. Down here is where we get into the settings that dictate when that lag chiller starts up and stops. So we have a lag on set point of 480 amps and a lag off of 460. So what that basically says is when our lead chiller, just like on the hot water side, achieves 480 amps or more and load, then after a couple minutes, it maintains that. Then we bring up our lag one chiller, which in this case would be chiller number three. Then once all that's running, uh, these two chillers operate in tandem. We, they're each given a set point trying to achieve 45 degrees. They maintain and do all their workings on their own inside, load and unload to maintain that until basically we see a drop in load on that lead chiller till it drops below the offset point of 460 amps. Once we get below that, we assume that there is a, a small enough demand out there to maintain the loop on one chiller, so then we shut down that lag one chiller. Whenever the chiller starts up, just like on the hot water side, uh, another condenser pump will start up with that lag one chiller before those pumps and anything can start, there's the isolation valves open up for whichever chiller is going to be called to run. And then their associated pumps 
chilled water and one more condenser water pump will start up to support the flow needed for that additional chiller running. And then vice versa, when your lag shuts off, your chiller will disable, your pumps will run a few minutes to flush everything through, then your pumps turn off, and then your isolation valves will close back off. If you need to make any changes in here, uh, the web interface is pretty simple for making adjustments to anything. There's a couple ways you can do it. Uh, we can make an example here of our outside air lockout. So here we're looking at the chilled water system settings again. And we have our outside air lockout set point, which is this little object right here. You can hover over it with your mouse, and you can do this with any object in here. You're basically, any point on the system, you're gonna get a little menu that pops up just by hovering over that point in the graphic. There's two ways you can do it. You can go directly here oops, to the menu and choose auto value. Once, or I'm sorry, choose manual value, not auto. Once you choose manual value, you'll get a little pop-up window there. And in here is where you can type in what your new value is gonna be. So in this case, we're gonna try 65. Once you choose your new value, you say okay. And after a few seconds, system goes out, updates, and now your lockout says 65 right there. Uh, another way of doing it, and it's all a matter of preference, is you can hover over the object itself, and you can choose this first gold or orangish yellow line there. That one will actually open up a separate dialog window just for that point so you can see information about it. So if you select that one, it brings you inside to this point. And once again, you can do this with any points, whether it's inputs, set points, uh, outputs. Inside of here, you can see we're in a manual control because that little checkbox is checked. If you came in here and that was not checked, then that assumes we're in auto control, which allows the programming to dictate whatever that number is going to be. When we're in manual control, the programming has no control whatsoever on that point. So if we are in manual control or if you leave something in manual at a certain setting, it is going to stay in that setting until somebody changes it or puts it back into auto by unchecking that. You also get a little field here down here that says where the control source is coming from. That's what's telling it. That's what this, this value should be for that point. And currently it's called the Solano CC server which is the main server over here that we're talking to through the web. So once we're inside here, just like uh, on the little pop-up window, you can just highlight in this white text box what your value wants to be. We're gonna put it back to 66. And if you just say okay, what it'll do is update it and it'll take you back to the graphic you were just in. If you choose apply instead of okay, It'll apply the change, but you'll stay in that view of just looking at that point's information. One of the other things that's nice about looking at these points is if you need to find out what's going on, uh, why isn't a chiller running, you can use that same mapping to come over here, hover over your chiller enable point. You know, it is a BV right now. On the binary variables and binary outputs, instead of a manual value option, you have a manual enable or disable off and on, basically. Uh, whereas the analog ones, you have to put a specific value in. But if you open up that point, you come inside here, we can see it's an auto control because the manual box is not checked. And our auto value is disabled. So that means when we're in auto, this is what our value is gonna be and its control source tells us the page of programming inside the controller that is saying, hey, this should not be enabled right now. Uh, so you can use that as a tool to start troubleshooting as you get more in depth into uh, the GCL programming and coding language in here to start troubleshooting issues with the controls. If you ever wanna back out, you can hit cancel. Once again, it'll take you back to the graphic you were originally in. And the last little point on there, when you hover over something, 
pretty self-explanatory. If you click auto, it puts that point back in the auto control, which means programming can do its thing with it. Last thing you'll notice in here is we have some boxes that are yellow and some that are just white around the information there, the point. Uh, the yellow is what we use to indicate that a point is in manual control. So if the point is in manual, like I said, then it stays in that setting no matter what code we write in there because it ignores any programming when it's in manual. If that white box goes away, uh, so we can say like this set point here for the chiller, chiller one, if we put that to auto, the white box goes away and that just tells us that point is in auto. So if there were a case where the chilled water set point resets throughout the day, we need to make sure that these chilled water set points are in auto so that programming can dictate what that set point should be throughout the day. Put this back to the state it was. And that about covers our basic overview of the system. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me.